Hey everybody, just uh, checking in with you and going through the answers here. I'm just going to do a quick brief overview of that 1 through 15 that you guys were working on. And then we're going to take a look at that last part that I said to skip for now because it's new and different. Uh, as you went through this problem, uh, answer key is going to be posted later. But we were, uh, what was a little bit different is that the base was in the flask this time. Acid was in the burette, and that's a little bit different than most titrations. Usually it's the other way around. Uh, as a result, our pH graph started with a high pH. It was just the base in the flask, and then as we added our acid, it started to neutralize that base and bring down the pH. So when you are at just part A, it's weak base only in that flask. No acid has been added yet. And that weak base can hydrolyze with water, forming some hydroxide ions. So that's where we get our pH to start. Uh, but there's not many ions because NH3 is a weak base. So it does lean heavily to the left-hand side there. Then when we get to part B, the part we're going to focus on today, uh, you've added a little bit of acid to the flask. So you can see there in that boxed equation, the H3O plus is our limiting reactant in that case. We've added just a splash of acid to our relatively big flask of NH3. Uh, and so you'll get NH4 plus and water being formed. But that excess NH3 that's left over, the part that didn't react with the acid, can hydrolyze with the water and produce some hydroxide ions. So that's why when you've added that little splash of acid in the beginning, the pH is still staying pretty high from those hydroxide ions that are being formed from that reaction that you see at the bottom of the screen. When we get to the equivalence point, that's when we use up all the NH3 and the H3O+. They're reacting according to their stoichiometric ratio. No limiting reactant, no excess reactant. So we only have NH4 plus and water. The problem is those guys can react with one another to form additional products where we get additional H3O plus ions. So that's why that uh, when you look at that pH titration curve, the pH really starts to drop suddenly because we suddenly have this influx of H3O plus that wasn't there uh, prior to that. And then if you over titrate, if you add a ton of acid there, that excess is what's going to cause the pH to really drop. So you have just a splash of that NH3 left in the flask and a ton of H3O plus. So this part A, this was the stuff that we were doing in our previous chapter, that like acid-base chapter part one, how I said the acid-base chapter was so big, we were going to split it into two chunks. And so part A is just weak base with water, where you're doing KB values and ice tables to be able to figure out the pHs. So this was the stuff we were doing uh, prior to spring break when we had that quest on weak acids and bases, when we put salts in water to find out their pH, that kind of stuff is what this part A was all about. Part B is the part we're going to be focusing on in just a few minutes. And part B, I think part B is the hardest part of the titration because you have both unreacted NH3 left over and some NH4 plus that has already formed. Because you have a weak base and its conjugate acid in solution, you've called something, you've created something called a buffer. A buffer is basically a chemical that resists changes in pH. A buffer needs two parts. It needs an acid to react with any hydroxide ions that might be forming and a base that might react with any hydronium ions that might be forming. For it to be a buffer, the acid and the base can't react with one another. And so usually we make buffers out of conjugate acid-base pairs because our base in this situation is the NH3, 
the excess NH3, and our NH4 plus that has formed can act like an acid, a proton donor. So our NH3 has the potential for reacting with any hydronium ions that are being formed. The uh, NH4 plus can react with any hydroxide ions that might be there. So because we have both a base and an acid, and this base and this acid don't react with one another, that's what we call a buffer. We're going to see more about buffers soon. Um, but because you have both components there, things that can act as a base, things that can act as an acid, you have both happening in that part B on the graph, and that's what makes it a little bit harder. For part C, when you're at the equivalence point, this is the stuff that you guys were learning about uh, just prior to spring break when we had those emergency days and I did those e-videos for you guys to learn. So, And you took that uh, quiz for me online on Schoology. Uh, so that's what this guy was all about. So we're reacting at the stoichiometric ratio point and finding the volume of acid that would be necessary to make that happen and then figuring out what the pH is at the equivalence point. So at the equivalence point, you don't have any uh, of that NH3 or the acid left over. You only have NH4+. Plus. And because you only have the NH4+, plus, that can react with the water that's in there to create additional hydronium ions, and then we get our pH that's not 7 at the equivalence point from when we reacted our weak base with our strong acid. Uh, this part isn't really new for you guys because you saw this in the video yesterday. If you go past the equivalence point, your pH is pretty much based on the extra stuff that you've put in there. So you found out uh, in those previous calculations that to reach the equivalence point, you need 30 milliliters. If you put in 40, you've overshot that end point, uh, excuse me, the equivalence point by 10 milliliters. You could use that number to find the moles of extra stuff you've added in, the molarity of your solution at that point, and then find the pH. So there's a quick rundown of uh, the stuff that we've already done. And now we're going to see in just a second a video of how you deal with those calculations when you're in that buffer zone.